Localization processes exist in all cells and affect where your protein ends up after translation. Placing proteins in different parts of the cell is a common activity in genetic engineering. There are five readily distinguishable compartments in a gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli, defined by the presence of contiguous bilayer membranes that prevent the free exchange of biomolecules. There is the cytoplasm in the innermost compartment where all the central dogma processes and most of metabolism takes place. Then there is the periplasm between the two membranes and the extracellular environment accessible only by secretion. The two membranes also present distinct compartments to the cell where proteins can be inserted. All proteins start their life in the cytoplasm, so the cytoplasm is the default location of a new protein in the absence of other targeting mechanisms. Two pathways exist for periplasmic localization, TAT and SEC. SEC secretion involves a signal sequence, also called a leader sequence or pre-sequence. Often a gene will employ a pre-pro sequence on the end terminus, which is cleaved after transport completes. Pre-pro sequences are typically 18 to 30 amino acids long and contain one or more basic residues near the end terminus and a central 7 amino acid hydrophobic core. If a protein just contains a pre-sequence, it will remain anchored to the membrane after translation. If it has a pre-pro sequence, it will be proteolytically cleaved off, releasing the protein to the periplasm. During export, the protein is in an unfolded state and is often secreted coincident with translation. Popular parts for pre-pro sequences that you'll find in many common expression systems are the PEL-B and OMP-T leader sequences. The TAT secretion system similarly involves a signal sequence, but it doesn't need to be on the end terminus. It is the sequence S or T, then RR, anything, FLK. During TAT secretion, the protein first folds in the cytoplasm and is subsequently transported. The system will not transport non-folded proteins, which is a useful trick in various assays. Getting a protein to the outer membrane or extracellular environment is more challenging, but possible. Several of the E. coli systems have been examined extensively, including OMP-A, OMP-T, OMP-G, and LAMB-B. The process starts with sex secretion to the periplasm, and then they spontaneously fold and insert themselves into the outer membrane. The most popular strategy for targeting a protein to the outer membrane in prokaryotes is to fuse the protein to another protein that already goes there. Popular fusion-based targeting systems include OMP-A and a structurally dissimilar one called ice nucleation protein. If you want to learn more about what exists in this class, here is a nice list at this URL. In a gram-positive bacterium, there is no second membrane, and thus there are only three vesicular compartments, the cytoplasm, the inner membrane, and the extracellular environment. The same basic set of proteins and localization signals that directed proteins to the periplasm in gram negatives will target a protein for extracellular secretion in a gram positive organism. Thus, secreting proteins is usually much easier to achieve in a gram positive rather than a gram negative bacterium. Industrially, commodity proteins like proteases they put in detergent are usually produced in a gram positive bacillus strain. Various fungi are also good protein secretors used in industry. Targeting proteins for secretion is more challenging in gram-negative bacteria. There are at least six distinguishable types of secretion systems that cluster based on sequence homology and consistent aspects of function. The type 5 and type 2 secretion systems, shown here at left, are sec-dependent. This means that proteins being secreted will need to contain a pre-pro sequence on their end terminus, and the first step of crossing the inner membrane involves the sec apparatus. Types 1, 3, and 4 don't employ SEC, uh, and they form a contiguous conduit for secretion of protein from the cytoplasm to the extracellular environment. Type 1 systems are typified by the hemolysin secretion system from E. coli. Adding this functionality to E. coli requires three transport proteins, an ATP binding ABC transporter, an adapter protein that bridges both the inner and outer membranes, and an outer membrane pore. Secretion of a protein through this apparatus doesn't involve any periplasmic intermediate. The protein is shuttled straight through the channel. The targeting signal is a short 20 amino acid peptide on the C terminus of the protein. If you'd like more detail, here is a reference that shows that the last 60 nucleotides of HLYA are a sufficient targeting signal to transport alkaline phosphatase to the extracellular environment. 
Type 3 secretion systems are native to many clades of bacteria and are usually associated with bacterium host interactions. In addition to directing proteins across the two inner membranes, type 3 systems usually have the ability to secrete proteins across a host cell's outer membrane. Those hosts include plant cells and mammalian cells, and different type 3 systems are specialized for the host cell's surface structure. The genes are usually encoded as clusters and contain around 20 proteins with extensive internal regulation. They are both evolutionarily and functionally related to flagella, and in fact flagella can be repurposed for type 3 secretion systems in E. coli. The signal sequence does not appear to map onto a primary sequence. Instead, it is a property of the three-dimensional structure of the secreted protein. However, you can often target another protein for secretion by fusion to a native effector that is normally secreted by the system. Like with type 1 secretion, there is no periplasmic intermediate. Type 5 secretion systems come in two types. Autotransporter proteins involve a single two-domain polypeptide. One of these domains is an outer membrane barrel protein and the other is a passenger protein. A well-studied example of this class is the AG43 protein in E. coli. If you'd like to learn more about this, I suggest you look that up. The process begins with sex secretion to the periplasm as an unfolded protein. It then spontaneously inserts itself into the outer membrane and pulls the passenger domain through to the cell surface. Some autotransporter proteins remain this way while others undergo cleavage of the passenger to the secreted state. Both proteases and spontaneous processes can cause cleavage of extracellular domains from the membrane-bound barrel. So sometimes autotransporters result in secretion, and other times they result in display. Two partner secretion systems are very similar to autotransporters, but each is composed of two genes. Like the autotransporters, TPS systems involve dedicated secretion proteins for singular proteins, but they are genetically encoded as two proteins instead of a fusion protein. TPP transport results in secretion of the passenger protein. I don't have much to say about type, type 6 secretion. Microbiologists are still discovering new classes of transporters, and this is one of the newer ones. It involves a large cluster of proteins like type 3 secretion. Another process that occurs in prokaryotic cells is degradation. In eukaryotes, there is a large protein assembly called the degradosome that handles this recycling function, but it has far fewer components in prokaryotes and has a more utilitarian function in the cell. When a broken mRNA is translated, the ribosome will make protein until it reaches the end of the molecule, at which point it will become stalled holding onto both the mRNA and the nascent peptide. These stalled complexes are rescued by a molecule called tmRNA, which encodes a short peptide sequence, AND and ALVA. This sequence targets the protein for degradation. This mechanism can be used to direct a protein for proteolysis in the cell. A commonly used trick in synthetic biology is to, is to use GFP-LVA as a reporter gene for monitoring dynamic processes by microscopy. Proteins with this tag cycle in the cell instead of accumulating, allowing more faithful observation of these processes. I focused on compartments defined by lipid bilayers, but this is not the only type. Proteinaceous shells and aggregates of proteins similarly create local concentration effects and barriers to free diffusion of molecules in the cell. Compartmentalization strategies based on fusions to protein scaffolds, RNA scaffolds, and DNA scaffolds are being investigated as strategies to more efficiently direct flux through a biosynthetic pathway. Additional strategies include protein shells such as the carboxysome or virus particles.